Well, before I begin today, uh, I've seen several Chapel Street is out and around town since um, Christmas Eve weekend, and they've asked me, well, how did everything go? Twelve services, three campuses, we had the project we were trying to raise funds for, how did everything go? So let me just give you a brief report, more details will be coming out in the next week or so, but we had 12 services on three campuses over three days, and we had uh, just a little over 5,000 people attend those, which was a historic weekend in the life of our church. We were very, very thrilled with, by that. But even better than that, we had set a goal in December to raise $65,000 through our Serve the World missions uh, objective to help build a new home for uh, homeless boys in Rwanda, where Amanda Good works with Hope for Life. 65000 was our goal, which would have been the highest Serve the world total for a Christmas Eve service. So by the time we even got to Monday, Christmas Eve, we had raised over $100,000 already. I have no idea where the number is now, but we'll give it to you next week. So thank you so much for your generosity and taking care of that project. <clears throat> well, when I was 25 years old, uh, I had two college degrees, was finishing a master's degree, and uh, no job at least not a job that really paid any money. And I was, I was volunteering as a basketball coach at Taylor University down in Indiana. Had been working as a substitute teacher in local middle schools and high schools. And I was struggling to, to pay for my, uh, my classwork. I was struggling to pay for my little apartment. Really even, um, quite literally, struggling to eat, to pay for enough food. Uh, I was um, what they would call today an emerging adult. Have you heard that phrase? Developmental psychologists refer to a new phase of life in our culture called emerging adulthood. It's between adolescence and full independent adulthood. See, back a couple of generations ago, uh, young people in our culture were expected to go straight from adolescence to adulthood, right? You graduated high school, you got a job, you got married, you had kids, boom, adulthood. Not so much today. In 1960, the average age for marriage in our culture for a woman was 20. And for a man, 22. Today, it's around 30 for both. Now, there are lots of reasons for that cultural shift, changes in the economy, a need for more education, but the result is it just takes longer to navigate the transition from adolescence to full independent adulthood than ever before. So I like to think I was just ahead of my time. I was an emerging adult before it was a thing to be an emerging adult. So if you're here today and you fit into that 18 to 29-year-old category, I'm sort of your patron saint of emerging adulthood. I'd love to talk to you about it. i got a heart for what you're going through. But I decided I needed the real job. So I made an appointment with the acting president of Taylor University, a man at the time whose name was Dr. Milo Rediger. Uh, Dr. Rediger was, was a, a very accomplished, uh, generous man. It's the only picture I could uh, find of him on the Taylor Magazine. He had actually served as the president several decades before and had come out of retirement to be interim president again. Uh, My mother had actually served as his secretary when she was in college in the 50s, so I figured that was my ticket. I would just walk into his office, tell him who my mom was, and tell him I was a great guy, and he would give me a job. That's how I thought it would go. Um, So I went into his office, and I did my best to convince him that there had to be something I could do around the university for which they could pay me. Um, And when I finished my little speech... Dr. Rediger kind of leaned back in his chair and said something to me that all these years later I remember almost word for word. Here's what he said. He said, young man, I'm 79 years old. And when I look back across my life, the years between when I was 20 and 30, those 10 years, exactly where I was, those 10 years, I thought while I lived them were a great waste. He said, now looking back, I realize they were one of the most productive times of my life. God bless you. Have a nice day. That's what he said. (laughs) So I went in looking for a job, went out without a job, but actually something much better. I didn't realize it at the time, but now where I am today, looking back, Dr. Rediger was right. During those years that seemed frustrating, seemed um, difficult, Something good and productive was happening. God was doing something under the surface of my life that I couldn't quite yet see. He was right. And today I want to look at a conversation between two young men and Jesus that comes to us in Mark's gospel, a conversation that's always kind of reminded me of me barging into Dr. Rediger's office all those years ago. These two young men are looking for a job. They're looking for a position. 
They're looking for significance. So Mark chapter 10, I'm going to read the whole story through, and then we'll go back and break it down into pieces. Mark writes, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been repaired. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now you need to know this conversation comes right at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. He's just weeks away from the cross and the resurrection, and he spent the previous part of this chapter teaching them about the the eternal kingdom of God and even making reference to his coming arrest and to his death. And then seemingly out of nowhere, as if they're not even paying attention, these two young guys burst out with this seemingly outrageous demand. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to him, Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, think about that just for a moment. What if a child came to his or her parents with that same demand? Say, Dad... Uh, I'd like for you to do for me whatever I want. Now, what father in his right mind says, sure, just shoot. What's coming next? Car? Credit card? Probably both. Imagine if an employee goes to a boss. Say, uh, boss, I'd like for you to do for me whatever I ask. You know, is it going to be year-end bonus? Going to be company car? 30 weeks paid vacation? What's coming So what are these guys thinking? We're told that James and John are brothers. They're the sons of a man named Zebedee, who we know was a fisherman. They are working in their dad's fishing business when Jesus comes along, calls them to follow him, and they do. They become among the first followers of Christ, and along with Peter, form the very core, those closest, those three men closest to Jesus throughout his ministry. Gospel writer Mark, in fact, tells us that Jesus had a pet nickname for these two brothers. He called them the sons of thunder. We're not exactly sure why, but we see a hint in Luke chapter 9 when Jesus is not received well in a Samaritan village. And it's James and John who say, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven and just burn the city to the ground? Sons of thunder. Jesus had to talk them back, say, no, that's not exactly the strategy here. It's not what we're going to do. So here they approach Jesus with a surprisingly bold demand teacher, We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, before we are too critical of these two young men, uh, we need to know that they had been with Jesus for a little over three years by this point. And they've seen him do some just amazing things. They've seen him heal the sick, feed the hungry. They believed he was the promised Messiah, the anointed one of God who would save his people. They believe he's going to become king of Israel. And that's good. Therefore, they believe he has full power and full authority to do anything, including give them what they want. What they don't yet fully understand is exactly what kind of king Jesus is. So he responds to their demand by asking a revealing question. That's where we start today, a revealing question. Uh, Just a year or so before I went into Dr. Redder's office looking for a job, I was taking uh, classes at Taylor for a a second undergrad degree in Bible literature, and uh, one of the classes I had to take was called Theological Foundations. It was a popular class taught by a popular professor, and the very first day of class that semester, uh, before he said anything else, uh, this professor walked to the blackboard, we had blackboards in those days, and he wrote in big letters on the blackboard, Jesus is not the answer. Now, this was the 1980s. 
a time when that phrase, Jesus is the answer, uh, showed up a lot of places. It showed up in bumper stickers and cars, and you would see it a lot of times, a lot of places. It was very common. But he wrote on the blackboard, Jesus is not the answer. You could almost feel the discomfort in the room because he didn't say anything. You could hear the thoughts of the other students. What, what's, what's he saying? What's he thinking? Has he lost his faith? Has he lost his mind? What's going on? And then when it got really uncomfortable, he went back to the board and he wrote up a second phrase. He wrote, Jesus is always the question. Jesus is always the question. He went on then to explain that before we can assume that Jesus is the answer and make that claim, we have to understand what the questions are. In fact, that's kind of why we as a church are doing the Explore God initiative starting in a couple of weeks. Because we believe questions are important. We have to be able to ask questions like, does life have a purpose? Can I know God personally? Why does God allow pain and suffering in the world? Those are the questions people all around us are asking. Questions are how we learn, how we grow. Jesus actually loved to ask questions. In a typical rabbinical style, he asked questions all the time. In fact, if you count all the questions he asked in the New Testament, you'd come up with around 300 questions or so. Let me give you a few examples. In John chapter 1, when John the Baptist points to Jesus, now nobody knows who Jesus is yet, he points to Jesus and says, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Andrew, a young man, hears that, follows after Jesus because he's curious. Jesus turns around and says, what do you seek? It's a question. A question of purpose. In John 5, Jesus comes upon a man who's been paralyzed for 38 years. He asks this man a question. Do you want to get well? It's actually a question of courage. Because to get well means he has to live a new kind of life. In Matthew chapter 16, he says to his closest followers, who do you say that I am? It's the question of theology. In John 20, after the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. Jesus greets her with a question. Woman, why do you weep? It's a question of grief and pain. In Luke 24, when several women find the tomb empty, they're met by an angel who asks the question, why do you look for the living among the dead? It's the question of resurrection. In Matthew 14, Peter tries to walk to Jesus on the water, begins to sink. Jesus says to him, why did you doubt the question of faith. And in Mark 4, when the disciples are caught in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, they're terrified. Jesus speaks to the wind and waves and calms everything down and then says to them, why are you so afraid? It's a question of trust. Now sometimes we think that to come to faith in Jesus or to follow him means we're done with questions, that we don't have any more questions, that we come to church, we're not allowed to ask questions because it makes it sound like we don't believe. No. God isn't afraid of our questions. Jesus isn't afraid of questions. Questions are good. Questions help us to grow. Questions have power because they help us reveal and know our own thoughts, our fears, our hopes, our beliefs, our motivations. Questions call us to confession. And so when James and John come to him with this demand, Jesus asks them a question. What do you want me to do for you? Now notice, he doesn't promise to give them what they want, nor does he condemn them for their sort of childish demand. He doesn't say, that's a stupid thing to ask for. He just wants them to come clean, to be honest. Here's a thought. What if Jesus were to ask you today, and he would use your name, he says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Your answer to that question would tell you something about what you care most about in your life. Your answer would tell you about yourself. Even might tell you what you think about Jesus and who he is. He asks because he wants them to be honest with him. And that leads to the second point we see in the story, which is a revealing request. It's a revealing question, which leads to a revealing request. Uh, psychologists, psychologists and other people who study this sort of thing say that um, every human being dreams every night when they sleep. Uh, we, in fact, we all dream multiple times every night. How many of you can remember the dream you had last night? Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Most of us don't because we have so many dreams we don't pay attention to them. But back when I was in graduate school, I was 
taken a class. We had to read about uh, dream theory and so forth. And this one book we were reading, the author claimed that uh, anyone can learn to remember their dreams. I thought that was curious. He had a little technique, and so I thought, that'd be interesting. I'm going to try that. So I, I practiced this simple technique, and the first night I tried it, uh, nothing. Second night I tried it, I, remember, I remembered one dream. Woke up, clear dream in my head, the whole story. Long, complicated dream. Then the, second, the next night, I remembered three. So I woke up and write them down. Three dreams. The third night, I, I remembered seven distinct, complete long dreams. It was crazy. I had to stop doing it because I couldn't sleep. I, couldn't, I was getting, getting sleep. <laughs> But one of those dreams I still remember to this day, I was in a very tall building, like uh, a tower, like the Sears Tower. What's it called now? The, I don't even know what it's called. But like in the hundredth floor of a big building, and there were glass, glass surrounding the building. I could see out into this great city stretching out below. And I was sitting around a very important looking round table. And sitting at the table were seven men. I don't know their names or who they were. But I knew in the dream that they were the seven richest, most powerful men in the world. And I was leading a Bible study. <laughs> that was before I even decided to go to seminary, before I knew I'd be a pastor. That dream revealed some kind of ambition. By the way, I never did meet those guys, unless some of you are holding out on me here. Um, <laughs> look at the ambition of these two young men, James and John. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, to understand what they're thinking, we have to understand the ancient world because they thought in terms of kingdoms. So there was the king, his throne was in the center, but whoever sat to the king's right and the king's left were people of great position, honor, and power. In the New Testament, we actually see this reference to Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus refers to himself as sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Paul says in Romans 8 that Jesus sits at the right hand of God. And that's what James and John wanted for themselves. Positions of honor, significance, and glory in the coming kingdom. Now, this request isn't all bad, actually. It means they recognize Jesus is the Messiah. They recognize he's the king. And they recognize he's got glory that the glory belongs to him, and they want to be part of it. They want to be close to it. And the truth is, that's part of human nature. We all want to be close to glory if we can. That's what celebrity is about in our culture. If a celebrity, a famous person shows up, what happens? A crowd gathers because everybody wants to be close to it, close to the glory, maybe touch the famous person, maybe meet them, maybe they'll make eye contact with you. That's what happens, uh, for example, on a sports team, like a basketball team. You watch the guys in the bench on a basketball team. If you're not on the floor, you at least want to sit close to the coach because you're closer to being important. I was a bench player in college, and I was way down at the end, and you're always trying to jockey to get a little closer. That's what happens in airplanes. Everybody everybody wants to be in first class, right? James and John simply want the good seats in the kingdom. They want to be near his glory. They want to share in it. But they want this glory and honor and position for themselves, and they try to get it by demanding it. See, what they don't yet understand is the pathway to glory lies in a different direction. That leads us to the third point today, which is the call to discipleship, a call to discipleship. Years ago, I remember reading a story about Tiger Woods, the famous golfer, way back at the beginning of his career, before he came into all the personal trouble. But he was hitting balls on a practice range, I guess, before a tournament, and some young fan came up and was able to get close enough to him to say to him, hey, Tiger, I want to be just like you. And usually he would just ignore that sort of thing and go on hitting golf balls. But this one time, he turned around, walked over to this young guy and said, hang on, young fellow, no, you don't. Unless you want to come out here every day of your life and hit a thousand golf balls until your hands bleed, you don't want to be like me. Look what Jesus says here in verse 38. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Now, what's Jesus talking about here? When Jesus says, can you drink the cup that I drink, he's talking about his coming suffering. In Matthew 26, on the night of the Last Supper, the very night he's arrested, Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is what he says, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. The cup is the suffering of the cross. What does he mean when he says, can you be baptized? 
with the baptism I am baptized with. Here he's also talking about his death. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized were baptized into his death? So Jesus here is revealing to these two young, ambitious men what kind of king he is. That he's a king that doesn't rely on power and position, but rather a king who gives himself away in suffering and sacrifice for our salvation. That the pathway to his glory is going to lead through suffering and death. But notice James and John don't yet understand. They just blurt out, we can, we can. It's like they haven't heard a word he said. They just want the good seats. And Jesus says to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. Now scholars here believe Jesus is subtly pointing to how James and John are going to live out their lives. We know from later in the New Testament, Acts chapter 12, that James was actually the first of the 11 after Judas died, first of the 11 to be martyred that King Herod put in the death with the sword. He was the first one. The apostle John was not martyred, the only one of the 11 that was not killed for following Jesus. He lived a long life, but he was also imprisoned and exiled by the Roman emperor. He also suffered. And then after this, the conversation shifts, verse 40, 41. And when the 10, the other 10 of the 12, heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Now, why do you think they became indignant? Were they offended on behalf of Jesus that these two guys went? And it, no. They were mad because these guys got to the front of the line, thought about it before they did. Or we're going to get the good seats before they could get them. So Jesus calls all 12 together and has a little talk, a teaching session, which we are privileged to receive this morning. Verse 42, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Thinking about the Roman structure of authority. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want you to see Jesus is doing two things here. First, he's explaining the nature of true greatness. And second, he's issuing a call call to discipleship, to following him. First, true greatness. Notice, Jesus has no issue with James and John wanting to be great, wanting to be near his glory. But he does want to redefine what greatness is. That's the issue. The world, and all the way up into our culture, has always defined greatness as power, talent, and accomplishment. For example, Historical figures like Alexander the Great conquered kingdoms, slaughtered thousands. We call him the Great. Hockey star Wayne Gretzky had a nickname. What was it? The Great One. Because he scored lots of hockey goals. Of course. Jesus teaches that true greatness is not found in position or accomplishment or talent. It's found of all places in servanthood. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. See, the issue is not wanting to be great. The issue is the definition, the direction of greatness. Then comes his call, the call to discipleship, the call to be like him. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He wants these 12 young men to see, and I think he wants us to see today, that true greatness, true significance, even glory, is, can only be discovered and experienced in the call to discipleship. He wants us to know that true greatness comes at a cost. The cost of discipleship is the death of misplaced selfish ambition. Ambition is not bad in and of itself, but Jesus wants us to reconsider the direction 
of our ambition? Are we climbing up the ladder of success as defined by our culture, success, status, wealth, all of that? Or are we climbing down the ladder that Jesus describes as true greatness, servanthood, serving all? Which way are we climbing? The cost of discipleship, he says, is servanthood. Just as Jesus came to serve us, so we serve others. So that's the cost. But there's good news. With the call and with that cost also comes a promise. Because the same Jesus who said, can you drink the cup I drink, also said in John chapter 10, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. That's the promise of the gospel. The promise of new heart through the forgiveness of sin, through the cross. The promise of new identity by being adopted as his children. The promise of new purpose, living for his kingdom. And the promise of new destiny, living forever with him in the new heaven and new earth. And the result of that is life more abundant. And then he adds one more thing in John chapter 15. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy might be full. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm calling you to live a life of true greatness. Did you know that Jesus wants you to be great? That he wants you to know a life of true greatness, of abundance and joy? A life of significance and meaning, not greatness measured by the measuring sticks of our culture, Success, wealth, status, position, but greatness measured by love, service, generosity, and sacrifice. A life invested in his eternal kingdom. That's why the project in Rwanda, where Amanda serves, strikes a chord with us. Even if we can't say it, it strikes a chord with us of, of greatness, true greatness. And we want to be part of that. That's what Jesus is saying. The cost is great. It costs you your selfish ambition. It costs you your own personal kingdom. But the promise is greater than we can even imagine. Uh, my brother Joe is a pastor in Ohio, and I've told stories about him through the years. Um, he likes to tell the story of years ago coming home from a mission trip that he led with high school students. He was a young youth pastor just getting started in ministry, and he was on his way home. Uh, for some reason, he was traveling by himself. He must have stayed longer or something, and he was coming back, and he was on an airplane. Um, he was, ended up sitting next to a guy, total stranger to himself, a guy about his own age. But he noticed the guy was in, in a, 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 just an immaculate, uh, beautiful suit of clothes, gold watch, uh, polished shoes. Everything about him said success. And my brother had packed a, uh, some clean clothes to wear back on the trip, from the trip, but they were rumpled because they'd been in a suitcase. His, uh, his shoes had mud and concrete dust caked on him, and he was unshaven, kind of, kind of looked uh, uh, lousy, and he knew it. But they, he started the conversation with this, this guy, and eventually he asked the guy, well, what do you do for a living? The guy happened to share that he was an executive with a Fortune 500 company, went into some detail about his, his firm and, and uh, how large it was and his responsibilities and so forth. And then sort of just to be polite, this guy asked my brother, so, so, so what do you do? And he said, well, I'm a, I'm a youth pastor at a church. And he said the guy registered like zero interest and said, oh, good for you. And he went right back to reading his Wall Street Journal or whatever. And then my brother said, he said it was interesting. He said, usually he would have been offended by that. Uh, he would have been angered by that at the guy's sort of brush off and assumptions about him and his arrogance. But he said he didn't feel that, and it surprised him. He didn't feel angry. He didn't feel envious of the guy's obvious success. As he sat there thinking about it, he realized what he felt was, was pity a kind of pity and sadness for the emptiness and smallness of a life lived climbing one direction up the ladder of success as measured by our culture. And he felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude for the privilege of being invited to follow Jesus downward into a life of potential greatness, of service. We stand at the beginning, at the end of one year, the beginning of a new year. New Year's is only a couple days away. And as we stand 
looking at the future, two things I believe are true for each one of us. Two things. First is, we are all giving our life to something. Every human being gives their life away to something. Can't help it. It's just how we're wired. We all give our life to something. The second thing that's true is that we all want something. Desperately. We all want greatness. We all want significance. We all want meaning. Jesus says, true greatness, true life, True joy comes through my call to discipleship. So the question Jesus asked as we all head into 2019 is the same question he asked 2,000 years ago to these two young ambitious men. So, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? You bow with me as we close. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the question you asked these two ambitious young men so long ago, what do you want me to do for you? If we're honest, we all want many things, and so often we settle for wanting lesser things. Help us to want what you want to give. Lives of true greatness, lives of service, lives invested in your kingdom and your glory. Thank you for calling us to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.